Hey, everybody, and welcome to today's lecture. Um, today, we're going to be discussing enzymes and non-enzymatic protein function. Um, so basically, enzymes are a super diverse uh, macromolecule that are going to be really important for you to know on the MCAT. Um, so we're just going to you know, go over it, review a little bit of um, the functions of both enzymes and non-enzymatic proteins. Um, my name is Chris. Um, and this is um, brought to you by Socratic Med, and we are a grassroots nonprofit to provide sensible solutions to students with disparate medical school opportunities. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about us, um, there are a couple of ways you can get in touch. Uh, we have an Instagram, I put the handle right over there. Um, the office hours sign up at the bottom, that link tree actually links all of these. Um, so you could go to our YouTube page, you could check out our website, um, and we mainly communicate with students through GroupMe. Um, so you can use that link to join, or if you'd like to join, um, you can email me, I'll put my email down um, on the next slide and at the end of the lecture. Um, and like I said, we also do office hours. So if you go to that link tree, you'll be able to find a Calendly link and you can sign up for 30 minute sessions with myself or any of the other tutors that we have. Um, and everything is free. So on a more personal note, my name is Chris. I graduated from Stony Brook University in May of 2019. Um, and I finished on a pre-medical track with a Bachelor of Science in Applied Math and Statistics. Um, I took the MCAT in April of 21, and I scored a 520, which for that test was the 97th percentile. Um, and I did get a perfect score on the psych social section. So my tutoring specialties are usually biology, psychology, and sociology. Um, so something to keep in mind if, if you're looking um, to schedule like a one-on-one -on -one office hour session. Okay, so we'll just dive right in. So the first thing we're going to talk about is protein structure. Um, which is very important. I have to say most of the material in here is extremely high yield on the MCAT. Um, so you should do well to know pretty much all of the information in this video, um, especially the things that are bolded on each slide. Um, so a quick introduction to protein structure. Uh, proteins can act as enzymes, hormones, receptors, transporters, antibodies, um, or a structural support both inside and outside of the cell. So we talked about uh, the cytoskeleton and the extracellular matrix and some other um, some other videos, um, and you can see proteins are super diverse, um, and um, we're just going to discuss a little, a little bit about that um, in a little bit. So proteins are polymeric chains formed by monomers known as amino acids, and there are 20 amino acids that you need to know for the MCAT, uh, and we're going to discuss that on the next slide. So basically, amino acids interact three-dimensionally with each other to fold into a protein, um, and, and they're structured in four different levels. Uh, so we'll go over each one of them individually. Um, and it's pretty important that you know all of them. <clears throat> but right before we do that, we're just going to discuss amino acids really quickly. Um, so by definition, amino acids have a backbone that consists of a carbon molecule attached to an amino group, a carboxyl group, and a variable side chain. So if you look right over here, um, down by this little diagram, uh, we have all the way to the left, that's that amino group. It's attached right over here to a carbon, which is known as the alpha carbon. So that is the carbon that's attached to everything else. We have the R group over here, um, a hydrogen on most of the amino acids, except for proline. Um, and then it's attached right over here to this carboxyl carbon. And we have um, this carboxylic acid group right over here. So this structure is the same for every amino acid. The only thing that's going to change um, is this, this side chain over here, this R group. Um, and these differing R groups are actually what give each amino acid its specific properties. So in reality, there are actually hundreds of amino acids. Um, your body can modify different amino acids to use it for different things, um, like hydroxyproline, for example, is a proline molecule with a hydroxyl group added to it. Um, but you're only responsible really for the 20 uh, proteinogenic amino acids. So those are the amino acids that we've been learning and reviewing you know, since high school. Um, and if you look to the right, this diagram does a pretty good job at grouping them into four categories. Sometimes you'll see other categories like um, they'll have like sulfur containing groups or um, they'll sort them into like ring structures. But these four, um, I think this is adequate enough for you to learn. Um, you do need to memorize this. I think that the best way uh, to memorize the amino acids uh, is probably flashcards. That's the way that I did it. And I think it was pretty effective. So you should know the name, the structure, the three letter code and the one letter code for all 20 amino acids. Um, it can only help you for the MCAT. Um, and obviously, of course, you should know uh, how each side chain interacts um, you know, with other side chains that are the same and other side chains that are different. OK, so we're going to talk a little bit about the four structures. So the first structure is the primary level. So the primary structure is the simplest level of protein structure. It's simply the sequence of amino acids bonded together by peptide bonds. These are the only interactions that occur at this level. 
So if you look right over here to the right, um, that's exactly what it is. These little dots are just amino acids, these little uh, circles. And the primary structure, we are just considered of the sequence and the order of the amino acids that are coming. Um, the only interaction at this level are those peptide bonds. Um, and actually, peptide bonds are only present at this level. Um, so all proteins have a primary structure, obviously, because the definition of a protein is that it's made up of amino acid monomers. Um, so all proteins do have a primary structure. Uh, secondary structure. So the secondary structure constitutes the initial and most basic level of folding. So this is when the protein actually starts to fold, and it arises from hydrogen bonding between backbone amino and carboxyl groups. So that's the important part to understand about secondary structure, is that the only um, just like peptide bonds are the only sort of interaction that's going on at the primary level. At the secondary level, the only thing that's happening, the only sort of um, molecular, intermolecular interactions that are occurring is hydrogen bonding. And it's only between the backbone, amino and carboxyl groups. So if you look to the right, you can see the two forms, um, the two motifs that are most common on the MCAT and um, are just super important to know for, um, you know, when you're learning biology and biochemistry. Um, this one to the left is the alpha helix. And you can see uh, it's a pretty good diagram, and it pretty much shows how the backbone, um, how those nitrogen um, and carbon, the carboxyl groups, are actually hydrogen bonding to form this alpha helix. Um, and this is the beta pleated sheet, which is slightly different conformation. Um, we're going to discuss both of these um, a little bit more in detail in just one second. Um, but like I said, the most important part of the secondary structure is that hydrogen bonding occurs between the backbone. It has nothing it does not have anything to do with um, the R groups just yet. Okay, so the alpha helices, beta pleated sheets. Alpha helices are often found in proteins that act as hormone receptors and ion channels in the cellular membrane. So those are those transmembrane uh, proteins. You often find alpha helices in those proteins. This is because most of the hydrophilic interactions occur inside the helix and most hydrophobic R groups point outward. So remember when we're talking about the cellular membrane, it's a hydrophobic environment. So anything that's hydrophilic or electrically charged is not gonna be able to associate into the membrane very well. Um, so beta pleated sheets don't do a very good job of hiding their hydrophilic R groups. Um, alpha helices, however, just because of that coiled structure, they can orient things inward and outward toward the environment. So when we're in an aqueous environment, we want those hydrophobic R groups to be inside and we want the hydrophilic groups to be outside. Um, that's just the lowest energy confirmation. And um, that's how these alpha helix proteins, uh, these alpha helix uh, motifs can stay inside the cellular membrane. Um, one interesting fact um, is that alpha helices cannot contain proline. Uh, proline is this molecule right over here to the right. So if you remember before, um, the basic structure of an amino acid, we have this alpha carbon right here. Um, we have right over here the carboxyl carbon. Um, this whole carboxyl group, and this alpha carbon is attached uh, to a nitrogen over here. But if you notice, this is a secondary nitrogen as opposed a nitrogen as opposed to a tertiary nitrogen on the other uh, amino acids. So that has some pretty big implications in how the primary structure affects um, the folding into the secondary structure. Um, so because this is secondary, um, it causes a problem uh, forming alpha helices for two reasons. So first, the secondary nitrogen caused by its unusual R group causes a kink in the peptide being formed. Um, so because of this, the secondary nitrogen over here, it can't form um, sort of those straight long chains that the other amino acids can just because of the actual geometry of um, that secondary nitrogen. So it causes a kink in it, uh, which makes it very difficult to form certain uh, motifs, especially the alpha helix. So the formation of a peptide bond with proline eliminates the only hydrogen attached to nitrogen. Um, thus removing the potential for hydrogen bonding. So when we're talking about peptide bonds, this nitrogen is going to peptide bond with the carboxyl group of um, another amino acid. And the only, the only way it can possibly do that is by getting rid of this H. So when we get rid of that H, there's no possible way that that nitrogen can hydrogen bond. Um, and remember, when we're talking about secondary structures and alpha helices, it is the backbone interactions of um, the amino acid residues that are actually making that motif, that are creating the alpha helix. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Proline is really um, just like a special case out of the 20 amino acids. It's actually referred to as an amino acid with an I. Um, so in beta pleated sheet configurations, hydrogen bonding occurs between residues that are distant from each other and sometimes even on different chains. So 
uh, compared to alpha helices where it's just a couple of amino acids away and they're bonding and that's what's forming that coil, the beta pleated sheaths are usually uh, very far away. Um, and sometimes they're even on different peptides. Um, and that's what causes that sort of wrapping around that long folding, uh, long folding shape. And these sheets can have chains that run parallel or anti-parallel. So parallel means they're running in the same direction. That's usually um, two peptide, two separate peptide chains. Um, they're running in the same direction. And usually anti-parallel occurs with the same peptide chain because it's wrapping around kind of like a snake doing a sort of meander. Um, so every time it passes itself, it's going to be going in the opposite direction. Okay, so tertiary structure, uh, which involves interactions between very distant residues. Um, and when I say residues, I mean um, the amino acids that are bonded to each other. And it's important to understand that this, at the tertiary structure, all of these interactions are occurring between R groups, between those 20 different side chains. We're not talking about the backbone anymore. So there are four interactions that occur at this level that you must know. Um, so we have hydrogen bonding, again, as long as the R group is allowing for hydrogen bonding, that can occur. Remember, it's R groups, it's not the backbone. Uh, we have van der Waals forces. Um, they're sometimes known as nonpolar forces, hydrophobic interactions. Um, we have disulfide bridges between cysteines, because remember, we have that, um, we have that sulfhydryl group uh, that can bond to each other and they can create disulfide bridges, which will stabilize the protein. And then we have uh, electrostatic interactions. So we can have um, like polar interactions between char charged side chains. We can have ionic interactions. Um, so all four of these interactions are happening between side chains and they all, um, they all contribute to that tertiary folding of the structure. So the folding is actually driven by interactions between the side chains and the solvent as well. So this protein is going to fold. Um, it aims to fold to adopt the lowest energy conformation state. So for example, like we mentioned before with the alpha helix, um, it's the same, that same sort of hydrophilic pointing outward, hydrophobic pointing inward. Um, that theme pretty much runs through secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. Um, so hydrophilic R groups are going to be exposed outward, while hydrophobic groups will fold inward away from the aqueous environment. Um, and if you look over here, this is an example of a tertiary structure. Uh, it's pretty simplified. Um, but you can see the different bondings. So right over here to the bottom left, uh, we have a disulfide bridge between two sulfur groups. This acidic and basic interaction over here would be um, electrostatic interactions. We got some hydrophobic interactions over by the orange. Um, and then we have hydrophilic interactions over here. Okay, so quaternary structure is the largest structural level of some proteins. And it's important to keep in mind that not all proteins do have a quaternary structure. So they arise when two polypeptide subunits interact to form a multi-subunit complex. Um, so if you look below, we have hemoglobin. I'm sure you're all familiar with hemoglobin. That would have a quaternary structure because we have four different subunits that are um, associating together, not with a peptide bond, but they're associating together and they're creating one larger complex. Um, and we identify all four subunits as one complex known as hemoglobin. It's not an enzyme, but it is the same exact concept. Um, so the forces that stabilize quaternary structures are the same as those at the tertiary level. So it's those uh, interactions that we were talking about with the side chains in the last slide. Um, and like I said, quaternary structures cannot be bonded by peptide bonds. Um, they're two distinct polypeptide chains. So if there's a peptide bond between the two of them, then they would no longer be considered two distinct polypeptide chains. And the whole structure would just be considered tertiary because it's the same chain. Okay, so that brings us to the first review question. Um, so read this over. I would pause the video, take about a minute to answer your question. Um, and then when you unpause, I'm just going to go over the answers really quickly. So which of the following proteins does not have a quaternary structure? Okay, so we'll go over it. Which of the following proteins does not have a quaternary structure? The correct answer is alpha tubulin. Um, so let's go over it. A hemoglobin um, is actually what we just discussed. Uh, what we just discussed. It's actually uh, made of four subunits um, that are not bound by uh, peptide bonds. So that does have a quaternary structure. Um, and the other two, pyruvate dehydrogenase and ATP synthase, are two very uh, complex proteins. Um, and they definitely have multiple subunits. Um, so basically, it's really just the absence or presence of subunits that we're looking for to identify if a protein has a quaternary structure. So alpha tubulin itself is a monomer um, of tubulin. So it's not a quaternary structure. Alpha tubulin itself is just um, a singular monomer, a single polypeptide chain. Um, once it polymerizes, um, you know, that filament 
definitely does become a quaternary structure, but alpha tubulin at itself um, does not have a quaternary structure. Okay, so uh, enzyme introduction. Now that we discussed how proteins are made, we're going to um, go into one of the really important functions of proteins, which um, are enzymes. So an enzyme is a biological catalyst that is not used up in the reaction. Enzymes work kinetically, not thermodynamically. So this means that enzymes do not affect the delta G of the reaction, but lower the activation of the energy, the lower the activation energy of the reaction to speed it up, that should say. So what that means is, um, a reaction is going to proceed towards its equilibrium, and when you add an enzyme, it is not going to affect the equilibrium at all. It's going to affect how quickly the reaction will proceed to that equilibrium. So it's not affecting the delta G, it's not affecting the energy of it, it's just affecting the speed and the rate of the reaction. So that's why we say it works kinetically, not thermodynamically. It's not changing the thermodynamics of the reactants or the products. Um, enzymes are categorized into different classes based on their function. So if you look to the right, um, these are six major classes. So we have oxidoreductases, transferases, isomerases, hydrolases, lyases, and ligases. So um, you can pause, um, download the slides, just take a look at that. That's a pretty good graph. Um, definitely be familiar with what they do. Um, and it's also important to keep in mind that just kind of like everything else we've been talking about, you'll see a bunch of different classifications for different um, you know, like when you're going over different topics or when you're getting it from different sources. So like uh, enzymes, for example, you may also see them categorized as kinases, polymerases, phosphatases, phosphorylases, and proteases. Um, <clears throat> so it's it's just important to understand what the enzymes actually do because those other categories, depending on who you know, depending on who creates the graphic or who you're talking to, um, those will all fit into one of the categories that I have to the right. Um, so I would say definitely at least these six major classes you should know, and those that I listed below as well, you should definitely know what they do. So enzyme structure and function, enzymes fold into specific formations that always have an active site. This is the location of enzymatic activity. So there are two models that seek to explain the interactions between substrate and active site. So the substrate is obviously the molecule um, on which the active site is acting. So the lock and key model or the active site model claims that the substrate and active site are a perfect complementary shape and fit together, similar to a lock and key. So um, they are, completely complementary shapes. Um, the substrate goes into the active site, just like a key would fit into a lock. The, um, the reaction occurs, and then the reactants are released. Um, that differs from the induced fit model, which claims that the active site and substrate have slightly different shapes, um, but the enzyme undergoes a conformational change when they bind. So it actually changes to fit into the form of the substrate. Um, in both models, the enzyme lowers the activation energy by stabilizing the transition state. So we know for a fact that that's how enzymes work. Um, and to the right, this is a graph that you'll definitely see uh, pretty often. Um, so if you see this larger hump, that's the uncatalyzed reaction. Um, and in order to start that reaction, we have to get from this reactant point all the way up to the transition state. So if you look at the catalyzed reaction, uh, we have to go a lot um, we don't have to go as high as the uncatalyzed reaction because the activation energy is much lower. So it's going to be much easier to get over that lower hump than it is to get over the higher hump. Um, and that's basically what enzymes do. They just lower the activation energy, but you can see that in both reactions, the energy of the reactants and the energy of the products are both exactly the same. Right over here, this free energy change is exactly the same in both reactions. And that's what we were talking about before, how it doesn't change that delta G, um, it just changes the kinetics. It gets there a little bit quicker. Um, so regulation of enzymatic activity. Many enzymes do not have to be constitutively active. Um, constitutively active means that they're constantly being produced and constantly being created. Uh, and there are multiple ways that they can be regulated. So some enzymes can be modified by covalent bonding. Enzymes can be activated or deactivated by adding a phosphate group, for example. Um, some are produced in an inactive form, which is called a zymogen, um, and they must be cleaved in order to become active. So sometimes they'll have a cap or some sort of inhibiting protein that's attached to them. Um, and when you cut that off, uh, the enzyme becomes active. So other enzymes can only begin catalytic activity by associating with a regulatory peptide. Um, so they have to associate with a certain protein before they become active. And then finally, some enzymes are regulated allosterically, meaning modification of activity occurs at a site other than the active site. So um, that could be, you know, that could be either uh, inhibition or it could be like excitatory and it could 
encourage uh, the enzyme activity. Quantifying enzymatic activity. Enzyme kinetics is the study of the rate of formation of products from substrates in the presence of an enzyme. Before we look at a graph, let's discuss some important variables. Um, this stuff is very important. I always, always see this on MCAT. Um, Michaelis Menten plots, enzyme kinetics, uh, line Weaver Burke plots, which we're going to spend a little bit talking about right now. Um, definitely know this stuff. If you if this is something that you struggle to keep in your mind, it is definitely worth devoting the time to because this is very high yield. Enzyme kinetics is very high yield on MCAT. Um, so let's just go over the variables. Uh, v stands for the reaction rate or the amount of product that is formed over time. It's usually measured in moles per second. So V comes from velocity, obviously. Um, but the rate that we are measuring in terms of enzymes is measured in moles per second. Um, and that's moles per second of um, product that's formed. So th that S in brackets is the substrate concentration, obviously. Vmax is the rate of the reaction when all enzyme active sites are saturated, when adding more substrate does not increase the rate of reaction. So if you only have a set amount of enzymes, you're going to add substrates, and it's going to increase the rate up until a certain point. Because at a certain point, when you add substrates, there's not going to be enough enzymes to turn all of those substrates at a higher rate. Um, so we reach that saturation point, and that rate um, we refer to as Vmax. Km is also an important variable, and it's referred to as the Michaelis constant. So it is the substrate concentration at which the reaction is proceeding at half of its maximum rate. So Vmax is a rate, Km is a concentration, um, and they're related. We can use the x and y axis to relate that. So if we look at Vmax, we slide all the way over to this y axis. We want to look at half of Vmax, so we find halfway between, and then we just go over to the graph so we can find the corresponding x point. Um, because that X is going to be Km, because that is the concentration, since concentration is on the X axis, that is the concentration at which we are at half of Vmax on the Y axis. Um, so that's the concentration. Um, if Km is low, that means you only need a small amount of substrate to saturate the reaction, or the enzyme has a high affinity for that substrate. So Km and affinity um, are inverse. They're inversely related. The lower the Km, the higher the affinity. The higher the Km, the lower affinity. Something to keep in mind. Um, enzyme cooperativity. So when enzymes form multi-subunit complexes or they have multiple active sites on a single polypeptide, they may behave according to cooperativity. So in positive cooperativity, the binding of a substrate to one subunit increases the other subunit's affinity for the substrate. So remember the tense and relaxed states of hemoglobin. Again, hemoglobin is not an enzyme, but when it comes to cooperativity, um, it's a good example to look at because it's something that we learn about in, you know, in other topics. Um, so that tense state, it's a little bit more difficult to bind for the substrate to bind, but then once one of the, um, one of the subunits binds to that substrate, um, it enters a relaxed state where it's a lot easier for the other subunits to bind. Um, so that's what positive cooperativity is. It's after that first binding, um, the enzyme actually finds it easier to bind with the substrates. And the negative cooperativity is the exact opposite. It, that is much less common on the MCAT, but I mean, it's if you understand what positive cooperativity is, you understand what negative cooperativity is. Um, and you really only need to uh, recognize the graph for positive cooperativity. So if you look right over here, this is the michaelis menten plot um, for a positively cooperative enzyme. Um, and this has a sigmoidal structure. This has a sigmoidal curve right over here, this S is called the sigmoidal curve. So if you look at it, the reason why is because we start in this tense state over here. So the increasing rate is slow because we're in that tense state. But as we add more substrate, um, because of positive cooperativity, that enzyme is going to increase its affinity for the substrate. And it's going to start binding a lot more, a lot more quickly. And that's why we see this steep increase. And then obviously, we are going to hit our Vmax just like any other reaction. So it levels off right at that Vmax. And that's pretty much why we have this sigmoidal curve um, for positive cooperativity. OK, so lineweaver burke plots use the same variables as the michaelis menten plot, but they're graphed using a different formula. So um, the formula is not super important to memorize, but if you have, if you're confident in your ability to memorize formulas, it's a pretty good one to know. Um, just because we're going to talk about a bunch of variables below, and if you ever forget which variables uh, stand for what, um, you can always derive it from this equation. So you don't have to know it, but I mean, if if memorizing your formulas is um, memorizing, memorizing formulas is you know your thing, and you think that's going to help you, then I say go for it. Um, so one over v equals uh, km 
over V max times one over substrate concentration plus one over V max. Um, and the reason why we put it in this form is because the formula allows us to analyze the enzyme kinetics linearly. So if you look at that formula, it is in the form of y, equal M, y equals mx plus b. Um, so if we look below, we can analyze that, um, that formula and we can find all of these, we can find a lot of information from the line weaver burke plot about this interaction that we wouldn't be able to find um, on the michaelis menten plot. So the michaelis menten plot is very good to look at visually because it shows us, you know, where it levels off at Vmax, but the line weaver burke plot is very good for quantitative, um, getting quantitative information from the actual reaction. So our x-axis, because of this formula, is going to be 1 over um, the concentration of the substrate, and the y-axis is going to be 1 over the speed, the reaction rate. So the slope of our graph is going to be Km over Vmax, the y-intercept is going to be 1 over Vmax, and the x-intercept is going to be negative 1 over Km. And you should definitely know those formulas uh, for the MCAT. Okay, so the four types of enzyme inhibition. This is also another very high yield uh, topic on the MCAT. So competitive inhibition is the easiest, most intuitive type, I think. Um, so in this type of inhibition, the substrate competes with the inhibitor to access the active site. So the inhibitor usually resembles the substrate, but it does not elicit a response or form a product. Um, so that's exactly what it is. It's competitive because the inhibitor is actually competing with the substrate, and that is the mechanism by which it inhibits. It's competing, it's outcompeting the substrate. So a good competitive inhibitor would have a higher affinity um, for a substrate than I'm sorry, would have a higher affinity for the active site than the actual substrate. Um, and this type of inhibition, though, can be overridden by increasing the substrate concentration to a much larger value than that of the inhibitor. Because think about it. Um, if we're talking about mass action kinetics at that level, if you add more of the substrate concentration, it's going to be, if you increase the substrate concentration, it's going to increase the likelihood that the substrate is what reaches the um, active site rather than the inhibitor. So by adding more substrate, we can actually override the inhibition. So because of that, Vmax is not affected. We can still reach that same maximum rate if we add enough substrate. However, we're going to need more substrate to do that. So the Km increases, which means that apparent affinity is going to decrease because we need more to elicit the same response. So um, the affinity is going to decrease. Km would increase. Um, and right at the bottom, that's the michaelis menten and the line weaver burke plot. So you can look at the michaelis menten It levels off right over here at Vmax. Um, Vmax is not affected in both of them, but Km changes, as you can see. And the same thing over here, um, if we look at the line weaver burp plot, uh, Vmax is not changing. It's the same point right over here for both of them, but that Km value is going to change. So this is what it looks like on a line weaver burp plot. Um, and then we can use those variables. We know those variables to actually find out the values um, using that line weaver burp plot. So the second type, we have non-competitive inhibition. So these types of inhibitors bind at an allosteric site, not the active site, like in competitive inhibition. So we're no longer competing for that active site. They're going to a completely different location than the substrate is. So since the inhibitor is not competing with the substrate, you can't override it um, by adding substrate. So if we have an enzyme that's inhibited allosterically, it doesn't matter how much substrate you add, that enzyme is inactivated. It's not going to work. So because we can't increase um, because we can increase activity by adding substrates, the Vmax is going to be lowered and the Km is going to stay the same because the substrates are still binding, remember, they're just inactive. Um, so binding and affinity remains exactly the same, but the Vmax is going to be lowered. Um, and you can look to the right. I put the michaelis menten plot up top. We can see that Km value remains exactly the same, um, but the Vmax decreases. Um, so this one is the uh, uninhibited reaction and this two is the inhibited reaction. And you can look right over here. Um, no inhibitor present and inhibitor present. Inhibitor present. You can see right over here the Vmax does change. If you look at that uh, that y-axis, the Vmax changes. However, the K value, the Km value, does not change. It's that same point right over there. So third, we have uncompetitive inhibition, and it's important to distinguish between non-competitive and uncompetitive. Um, I don't really have a great mnemonic to distinguish, but um, I encourage you to find up your to you know make up your own or find one that helps you. Um, because it can be kind of confusing. Um, and they are similar. They do work in similar ways, but it's very important to know that they're different. So during this type of inhibition, the inhibitor will bind only to the substrate enzyme complex. So non-competitive means we're binding to the enzyme before it forms the substrate enzyme complex. Uncompetitive means we can only bind after the substrate enzyme complex is formed. 
So these, like non-competitive inhibitors, bind to allosteric sites. So again, we're not competing for the active site, but uncompetitive inhibitors only bind to the substrate enzyme complex. This also decreases the Vmax of the reaction since we can no longer reach the original maximum rate by adding more substrate. So for the same exact reason um, that, that non-competitive inhibition, um, that that maximum rate is decreased because it doesn't matter how much substrate we add, um, we're not going to reach that original Vmax. However, the KM decreases, um, the if infinity increases because the enzyme binds to the substrate and stays bound because of the inhibitor. So that's a little bit different. Um, the, the KM is actually going to decrease because Remember, these uncompetitive inhibitors can only attach to the complex. So if we have the substrate enzyme complex forming, then we finally have that inhibitor adding. It's going to be hard for that to dissociate. So that's going to increase the apparent affinity, and it's going to decrease the KM. And then finally, we have mixed inhibition, which is a mix between non-competitive and uncompetitive inhibition, which means the inhibitor will bind to the substrate enzyme complex and just the bare enzyme as well. Um, this type of inhibition, again, is not incompetitive, uh, is not competitive. And because we are, again, binding to an allosteric site, Vmax is reduced in the presence of these inhibitors. Um, so this... Uh, you should definitely know what the graph looks like. Um, you can see that the K, both the KM and the Vmax values are changed depending on what kind of inhibitor is used. Um, and that's, that's really what you should know about mixed inhibition. The other three, they'll definitely test quantitatively. Okay, so review time. Students in a biochemistry lab are running an in vitro experiment to graph the effects of a non-competitive inhibitor. Which of the following would occur after the inhibitor is added to the reaction? So pause the video, take a minute. Um, when you're done, unpause, and we'll go over it. Um, so for A, the KM would increase and the Vmax would decrease. That's not correct because the KM is not increasing. The KM is remaining the same. Uh, B is incorrect. The effective affinity between the substrate and enzyme would decrease. Um, that's incorrect because effective affinity is inversely related to uh, KM. So KM we know is staying the same. So the effective affinity is also going to stay the same because that binding hasn't been effective. Uh, so B is incorrect. C, the KM and Vmax both remain the same throughout the reaction. So the Kmax does uh, remain the same, but Vmax decreases. Um, the only one that's correct is D. The effective affinity between substrate and enzyme would remain the same, and the Vmax would decrease. So D is the correct answer. Okay, and we are just about done. We're going to go really quickly over non-enzymatic proteins. Um, so we have structural proteins. Not all proteins in your cells are enzymatic. In fact, most proteins are structural. They help keep cells and tissue shaped and supported. So actin and myosin, for example, are non-enzymatic proteins that are involved in muscle contraction and structuring the cytoskeleton. Actin, tubulin, collagen, keratin, and elastin are five of the most common structural proteins that are found in the cytoskeleton or extracellular matrix. Um, and kinesins, for example, are another class of non-enzymatic proteins that use ATP and the cytoskeleton to transport materials across the cell. And I use this, um, this GIF in my other lecture, and I just like it because I think it's so cool that, that that's a kinesin that's pulling uh, a cell or it's pulling some sort of uh, micromolecule across a filament. Um, so it's not an enzyme, but it's sort of structural. It's a motor protein, and it's, it's dragging things across the cell. So I, just, I think that's really cool. Um, so signaling proteins and hormones. Proteins can also circulate our, our blood in the form of peptide hormones. So recall that peptide hormones are slow acting and stable enough to be stored in vesicles for release. So the left, well, this would be an example of a peptide hormone. And you could see um, the peptide, you could see the structure. So over here, we have this nitrogen carbon backbone that's, that's going all throughout it. So it is indeed a peptide hormone. Um, and some examples of peptide hormones are insulin, um, CCK, which is involved in digestion, and ACTH, which is involved in, um, in the HPA axis. So these hormones, unlike steroid hormones, must interact with the surface receptors because they can't diffuse through the cell membrane. Because remember, peptides are polar, the cell membrane is hydrophobic. Um, receptors, channels, and transporters. So proteins also play a very important role in the selective permeability of the cell membrane. So GPCRs, which are G-protein coupled receptors, are an example of peptide receptor um, when it's bound to a ligand, a GPCR will undergo a conformational change, and with the help of ATP, um, I'm sorry, with the help of GTP and a newly dissociated G protein, the receptor can start a signal cascade inside the cell. 
Um, so ion channels are an example of a passive peptide channel. They allow specific ions to pass through the cell membrane without the help of ATP. So remember, we can keep those hydrophobic ends pointed outward toward the uh, cell membrane, and those hydrophilic ends are going to be pointed inward, so that can allow the ions to pass through the channel. Um, similarly structured are transporters, except they use ATP to pump, um, to pump materials either in or out of the cell, and they often pump it against their concentration gradient. Um, and the last type of protein that we'll talk about for today are immunoglobulins. They're also known as antibodies. So um, last but definitely not least, proteins play a huge role in our immune system. So recall that antibodies are a very important part of our adaptive immune response. I'm sure um, we are all familiar with that, even in just pop culture. I'm sure you guys have seen the type of virus that is pictured to the right at this point. Um, so antibodies target pathogens with a great specificity, um, and they employ multiple methods to overcome them. So they can signal, um, I'm sorry, they can neutralize pathogens, they can signal other molecules to destroy that pathogen, um, and they can also cause the pathogen to aggregate, which makes it even easier for other cells to destroy. Um, so proteins are super, super diverse, um, and that's basically what we were trying to get across in this lecture. So um, if you don't really understand some things in this lecture, it's I, I definitely encourage you to go back, pause the lecture, um, use Google, use your online resources, because everything that's in this lecture is super important. Um, and I encourage you to even do your own research and expand upon what we were just talking about here today. Um, so if you have any questions, um, you know, if you want to be added to the group me, any questions, if you want to ask me about the lecture or anything else regarding the MCAT or MCAT prep, you can email me right over there. Um, other than that, have a great night and I will see you guys next week.